previously on Retro Hack Shack. On this episode, I'm going to be looking at a device that will help us get video out of retro computers and into an HDMI device. Wow, that looks really good, just as you would expect it to. Whoops. Can you imagine if this actually worked? <laughs> Can you imagine playing Dungeons of Dagareth uh, on a big screen TV somewhere, or projecting it on the side of a building? That would be pretty cool. But I think I'm going to call this a success for sure. Uh, I did not expect this to come out quite this well. I was hoping it would. Okay, well, as you may have guessed from that uh, dramatic introduction, uh, today is another part in the series of adding HDMI to retro computers. Only this time, I also wanted to combine that with upgrades for the Color Computer 3. I've been wanting to do some upgrades for this computer for a while, and today is finally the day to do it. And one of those includes updating the video output to include HDMI. So I'm gonna go through all of those, but first I wanted to do a little comparison of the Coco 3 with the Coco 1 slash Coco 2. I'll probably be comparing it with the Coco 1 since the Coco 1 and 2 are very similar. But the Coco 3 is the, the one with the most capabilities, even though it's built on the same processor as the Coco 1. They didn't change the processor for this. And that just goes to show you how capable the CPU was in this machine, the Motorola 6809 that came with the Coco 1 and was included in all of the color computer line, the one, two, and the three. Um, and yet they were able to do some pretty cool upgrades with the color computer three. Now, for those of you that didn't grow up with a color computer like I did, you may not be familiar with the lineup, but you can think of the color computer three a little bit like the Commodore 128, right? So that was the next version after the Commodore 64, there was the Commodore 128, which had 128 megs of RAM, and it also had RGB output instead of just a, a TV tuner or a composite output um, and some other upgrades as well. The difference being that the Commodore 128 had two processors to accommodate the backward, backwards compatibility feature that they needed to have so that they could bring forward all of those Commodore 64 programs and be able to play them on the uh, Commodore 128. They really needed to have a um, two processors in there. So I believe they had the um, 6502, which was the original processor, and then a Zilog Z80. Um, this computer was able to perform basically that same sort of uplift, if you will, and we'll go through that, uh, but it was able to do it with the same processor. That means there was backwards compatibility all the way back, and it was much easier to have that compatibility because they were using the same processor. And it was just the things around it that got updated, but it really goes to show you how capable that Motorola 6809 actually was. So with that in mind, uh, as I get this thing uh, taken apart for the mod, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the improvements or differences between the Coco 1 and the Coco 3 and then some of the options that are available for upgrades, and then we'll come back and do some upgrades to this machine. So the first difference you'll notice between the Color Computer 1 and either the 2 or the 3, in this case, is the size. So in the Color Computer 2 and 3, they were able to reduce the size of the motherboard, thereby making it quite a bit smaller. You can see here, it's about four inches uh, shallower, I guess you would say. And this means that while I can fit the Color Computer 3 and 2 in the bottom of a tote very easily, the Color Computer 1 has to be kind of put on its edge to fit in there. It doesn't really fit in very well just because it's so deep. Let's take a look at the Color Computer 1. I showed this before on a previous video, but just to refresh everybody, um, you can see here the CPU, the PIAs, which control the interface, interfaces like keyboard and things like that. There's the ROM, um, and then there's a few chips that control the video as well as the uh, places to plug in peripherals and turn on the system. 
And you'll notice at the top there in the Color Computer 1, there was only one way to get video out, and this was with the RF modulator. Um, and that's where I, in the other video, tried to do a composite mod and failed, uh, um, unfortunately. But I was able to fix that later with HDMI out. Um, anyway, there's also a memory, of course, down on the bottom of the board. So I've zoomed in a little bit here on the Color Computer 3 main board, and we'll just walk through and see some of the differences here. So the Color Computer 3 has, of course, the CPU. Um, I mentioned this is the same CPU, the 6809. Technically, that's not exactly true. This is a later version of the 6809, which had a faster clock speed. The clock speed in the Color Computer 1 was 1 megahertz. The clock speed in this uh, later chip was still a 6809, but it's 2 megahertz. So they've stepped up the speed of the CPU, and of course, that's going to help things um, immensely. Um, there's also a, just a single ROM chip this time, so they were able to squeeze everything into a single chip, which saves some space. And then there's also the PIAs. Now the PIAs, the model numbers on them, you'll notice are a little bit different, but I believe these are both still PIA chips. Um, the only difference here is that they have been upgraded to support the two megahertz of the uh, more advanced 6809 CPU. And we have memory here. Um, you'll notice there's only four chips of memory this time, even though that's 128K of memory. And there's also these memory expansion sockets on either side, or at least on one side and below the memory. So this is what we'll actually be using later to expand the memory. Um, the system actually came out uh, when it was released. There was a, a 512K upgrade that you could perform, I guess, at home or bring into a Radio Shack and have them do. But we'll be using those same sockets to be able to do that. Um, there's also the, the same array of inputs and power on the back, joystick, serial cassette. Those are all there, um, but they've been able to squeeze those in together to take up a little bit less space. Now, you know, you remember I mentioned before on the Color Computer 1 that there was these three chips that had to do with video, the SAM, the VDG, and this special color chip. Those three chips work together to produce the signals, the composite signal that would be fed into the RF modulator. And one thing they were able to do with the Color Computer 3 is to take all three of those chips and add this chip that you see here in the middle, uh, which has a couple different names. Most people today refer to it as the Gimme chip. Um, which stands for Graphics Interrupt Memory Enhancer. And that's a pretty accurate description because this particular chip handles both memory mapping and uh, graphics modes. But it was also referred in the manual, in the service manual, you'll see it refer referred to as the ACVC or the Advanced Color Video Chip. But in any case, um, this combined chip that does memory and video in one chip is uh, what gives us the additional video output capacity of the system. So there's still an RF modulator that's been turned vertically in this case to uh, give us a little bit more room on the board and shrink things down even further. But there's also built-in composite, so I don't have to worry about building a composite mod. This thing came with composite and, vid and uh, audio output right on the back of the system. And you'll notice down in the lower right hand corner there, there is uh, some pin headers sticking through the board and that is for RGB output. So similar to the um, Commodore 128, which also had um, RF output, composite output and R RGB output, the Color Computer 3 also had all three of those. So it was really a very advanced system. Now, I mentioned the um, ability to upgrade to 512K. I just want to show you the upgrade instructions, which are in the service manual, and they explain basically how to do this. You take the uh, board that was, that was pre-built and pre-populated, take out the existing RAM, and then you slot this into those sockets that uh, I pointed out before, and you're basically good to go. And they even gave a little test program you could run to verify that 512K was available. So it'll be interesting to see if we can run this and see if it runs the same with the memory upgrade that we're going to perform or that I'm going to perform. So you might be wondering what kind of upgrades we can do with the Color Computer 3. And there's quite a number of them out there. But if we think of the type of upgrades you might want to do with a modern PC, for example, uh, you might want to upgrade uh, the 
the memory, you might want to upgrade the storage, you might want to upgrade the CPU, and you might want to upgrade the video card, right? Those are kind of the things, maybe if you have a computer that you've upgraded in the past because whatever reason. We can do the same thing actually with this Color Computer 3. So there is an, uh, a different CPU that is compatible with this CPU that's in the Coco 3, and it's made by Hitachi. And so we can upgrade the CPU simply by dropping in the um, Hitachi version, version, excuse me, the Hitachi version of this, which is the, I believe it's the 63C09 EP. Um, if you're going to do this, you do need to make sure that the you get the E version of this. That is important if you're replacing the CPU. So anyway, we could just drop that in, and we would get a you know pretty good performance bump just from having that version of the more modern version of the CPU installed. Looking at the memory, we can definitely there's the 512 upgrade that we could do, but instead I went ahead and purchased this 2 meg upgrade. But we can do this because of the way that the uh, Gimme chip works in doing the memory shifting. People have figured out a way to get more than 512 megs of RAM in. So I bought this 2 meg version and that will drop in basically like that. But it also came with the CPU that I was talking about, right? So this is the Hitachi CPU HD 63C09EP. And um, it, these are pretty cheap. They're usually less than $5 if you just get the bare chip. Sorry, my insulin was getting, uh, or my blood sugar was getting a little high. I had to take some insulin. Anyway, these chips are pretty cheap. Um, but however, the, there was a bundle deal where if I got this 2 meg version, I could also get this board, which they call the Guardian Plus CPU Buffer Protection Board, which um, I guess has some buffering, whoops, um, offers some buffering for the various data lines in here so that you can protect your, your chip from uh, getting shorted out or, or what have you. Anyway, the thing I found interesting about these two things is if I look at the back, of what's what's actually on this board? There's a Xilinx chip here, which looks familiar to me. Um, and if you watched uh, my first video on making these HDM uh, RGB to HDMI boards, you'll know why. If you want an, if you want a, uh, a description of what a CPLD is and and kind of a really high level overview of how it works, you can go back and watch that episode, the first one in this series, where I talk about how to build that adapter board. Anyway. This Xilinx chip, this Xilinx CPLD is exactly the same. It's a little bit different package, but it's exactly the same as the Xilinx chip, same model number as the Xilinx chip that's on this um, uh, RGB to HDMI board. Um, so it's they share some heritage here. So at least uh, three of the four upgrades I'm going to be performing are using CPLDs, which I kind of find uh, ironic and a little bit funny. So those uh, that will take care of the memory. So now we've got the CPU upgrade, the memory taken care of. Uh, for video, you've probably already guessed that we're going to be using the adapter I was just talking about, the RGB to HDMI adapter, uh, and we'll be using the analog board. But in this case, uh, we'll be doing analog RGB using the RGB out port that's on the bottom of this board to uh, pipe output to an HDMI monitor. So that's going to be the video upgrade. And last but not least, uh, for the storage, we'll be looking at this Coco SDC uh, board. I don't know if you can see the, the logo on there because of the reflection. Um, but this is a product, this is the first product that I recommend any new owner of a color computer get, this Coco to SDC, because otherwise you have to go out and source the media, the, the floppy disks or the... Um, uh, cassette tapes and things like that to load in. There's other ways of loading software in, but this seems to be right now in the community the most recommended way to get old uh, digital copies of uh, discs, tapes, other things. I don't know if it supports tapes, actually. It certainly supports discs and I believe cartridges as well. Uh, might be wrong about that. I'll have to check. 
but um, this is the this is the way that most people recommend, and I highly recommend the Coco STC. I've t I've used it on other videos that I've done. I don't know if I've actually ever talked about it. But this will top. This will round out rather the uh, upgrades that we're going to do. This will take care of the storage. So the first thing I need to do for these upgrades is I need to remove the existing CPU, the 68B09 needs to come out. And of course that's not in a socket. So I've got my uh, trusty desoldering station next to me. I'll take that out. And before I do that, I've got to get the board out. So let me get that chip out of there uh, being very careful because I definitely don't want to pull up any of those traces on this board. If I do, this project is going to take a lot longer than, uh, than I had hoped. And there we go. The board is now out. That was pretty easy. Uh, never mind. <laughs> it was easy till I got to this part. I guess I'm going to have to go ahead and take out all of this, uh, this shielding that's on there. And that's kind of a pain. It's, it's not too hard. Um, you just have to kind of use some needle nose pliers to get the, to get these, uh, uh, whatever you want to call them. They're, they're not standoffs, but they're little, little pins that hold the, um, the shielding in place and they come out, but yeah, this is going to be a little bit of a pain to get off, but oh, well, oh, one more. There we go. Yay. Just look at how many of these there, there were. Um, I mean, this board, they're all kind of in the palm of my hand there, but I don't know. There's like 20 of them um, that you have to get out. They're easy to get out. I guess I shouldn't complain, but Paul, was this your idea? Uh, man, this is just ridiculous. Um, maybe that's what it took. I don't know why they needed so many of these, but oh well, they're out now. Okay, and with that gone, I can now turn my attention to getting the CPU out of there. <laughs> Okay, well, I've done the first pass with the desoldering, desoldering gun, and I wanted to point out a couple of things. These are some things that I've learned uh, in doing this over the past few years. One is that the uh, when you're doing this, if you rip it out, if you rip the CPU out without making sure you've gotten the pin loose, you're going to pull up a pad. And then you're going to have to put in a bodge wire, or if you don't realize it right away, you know, it could cause problems. You have to go back and troubleshoot. So you want to be really careful when taking out these uh, uh, chips out of the boards. One of the things that I've learned is to look for the, the pit, so the pins have these uh, holes. Once you once you suck the solder out, they should have a little black hole around the pin where the solder was. And if you see that, that's a good sign. It's not a definite sign that you've got it all, but it's certainly a good sign. If you can see up on this pin, um, I can already tell that I didn't get all the solder around there because I don't see a black hole around the pin. So in that case, I'm going to have to go back and put some... Uh, the first thing I do is I go back and I put some solder, uh, fresh solder on there, and then try to suck that out again and see if that gets the rest of it. Um, the other thing that's good to check is if each of these pins are a little wiggly. They should be. Um, you should be able to wiggle them with like a flathead screwdriver in the hole. Sometimes they, you can hear the, the remaining solder kind of break. It kind of clicks. Um, but you want to make sure that that pin is loose before you go trying to pry it off the board. Then when you do pry it off, of course, use gentle pressure. Don't rip it out. And just take your time and make sure that uh, it's coming loose. If it's not, then go back over the board again. Look for those pins that maybe aren't uh, loose and see if you can uh, put some additional solder on and suck that off and see if it comes free. The last thing that I typically do, and I know some people use hot air guns, which I have a desoldering station. I can use that, but I don't like to heat up the chip. So typically the other thing I will do is I'll look at this side of the board. This side of the board can tell you a lot as well. If you look closely at some of these pins, again, you should see a hole uh, uh, next to the pins. If you don't see a hole, then there's solder that could be on the top side of the board here. And in that case, in fact, I think these pins on right here um, have solder there, and then these pins have holes on them. I don't know if you can see that. But um, in, in this case, what I might do is take some high-quality uh, desoldering braid, 
which I have some here, some high quality desoldering blade, uh, uh, bleh, braid or solder wick that has flux in it. And then you can go along with uh, kind of a chisel tip uh, on your soldering iron and you can press that in there and that will usually get the rest of the solder off. Keep doing those things until the whole chip comes loose and then it should come out relatively easily. Maybe not, you know, it might not fall out when you turn it over, but uh, you should be able to basically lift that thing out of there without too much trouble. Well, there's an old saying about the best laid plans, and that's certainly true here. You can see that uh, after working on this for about 15 or 20 minutes with all of the methods that I mentioned before, I was still uh, could clearly see some traces coming off the board. There were a few on the top and a few on the bottom as well. So I decided to go down to the makerspace and resort to that last option I mentioned of using the heat gun. Now, uh, you know, I worked on this going very carefully back and forth just over the pins. And this took about 15 minutes or so, or at least it seemed like that. But when it was all said and done, I was finally able to lift this chip out of there without any issues. So I just hope that I didn't damage this CPU um, with the uh, all the extra heat that I had to add to get it off the board. And you can see how <laughs> relieved I am. So this is what it looked like after I got the chip out. And you can clearly see some of the pads that were lifted. There's a few still dangling on, uh, but those will have to be removed because they're just very, very loose. And they're not going to be uh, making effective or, or a good connection at all. And here's what the CPU looked like. You can even see one of the pads still connected to one of the legs on the CPU there. So what I decided to do was to take a picture so that I knew where everything was connected and then flip it horizontally uh, so that when I turned the board over and started working on the uh, various bodge wires I was going to have to put in, I would have a, a better representation of where these things were going. Then I was able to pull that image up on my phone and compare side by side the top side and the back side of the board. And I could trace out where the pins needed to be connected and which ones were good and which ones were bad. And here's the results of my efforts. I only needed three bodge wires at the end of the day. And luckily this board makes uh, liberal use of tented or capped vias. You can see them all over the board there. And that made it really easy to connect these bodge wires where they needed to go. So as you can imagine, I was pretty nervous that this was all going to work or not. So I decided to do a test, put the old CPU back in the socket so I could see if that worked. And then I powered it up and voila, I was really excited to see that green screen after uh, all of the trouble with the CPU. Okay, well, I am so glad that uh, <laughs> my bodge wires worked out and the, the, I didn't hurt anything on that CPU, even though it's cheap to replace. I mean, like I said before, you can buy another one for less than five bucks. That's going to be even better than the one I took out of there. But, you know, I don't know. I just don't like to uh, throw those away um, or or hurt them. If I can save it, save one to fix another system someday, great. I'll put it in my spare parts bin. Uh, now, for the memory itself, that has to go like this, but there's a few things we need to do first. So we need to pull out these um, existing memory chips here. Hopefully they are they come out easily. There we go. Now, the instructions also said to take out a couple of capacitors, so those were real easy to remove. So I went ahead and took those out. And now I should just be able to uh, plug in the board into these pins that are alongside the uh, the board here. It should just, just have to line these up and push it down. There we go. So that's in. Uh, and then I can put the CPU in here. And you just need to make sure you line that up correctly with pin one going up like that. And then I'm going to take this jumper off that side because I don't need that right now. But uh, yeah, and the instruction said you could plug this in either way, but we just need to hook up this to the memory over here. There we go. So now we've got the memory upgraded, the CPU upgraded, and we can start to work on the video upgrade. Now, normally the analog board here uses two comparators, and those comparators are used to detect the color levels that are coming out of the source machine. In this case, 
uh, the Color Computer 3. Uh, but the Color Computer 3 actually has 64 different colors that it can produce. And so it actually needs a third comparator. This is an optional comparator to be added to the back of the board uh, to be able to detect those additional uh, variances in the voltages, which represent those color levels. And you can see I've already done that here. Now that that chip has been added to the analog board, I need to make a cable for the Color Computer 3 as it's different than the one I use for the Color Computer 2. So for that, I'm gonna need some IDC connections, some ribbon cable, and a clamp to be able to clamp these things down on that ribbon cable, as well as some diodes. Now for the end that connects to the Color Computer, it's pretty much straightforward. Just line up the cable in the uh, along the, the pins there and press down, and then you're going to need to use that clamp to actually push it in all the way. However, for the other side of the connection, the one that goes into the analog board, things get a little trickier. You're going to have to separate all the wires out like I've done here because this is where we're going to um, kind of mix things up and connect things to different... Um, uh, parts of the connection on the other side. You can see here I've got uh, a diagram that I made by looking at the RGB out um, from the color computer and then what the signals are expected uh, on the analog board. The analog board expects a combined horizontal and vertical sync, and yet the TRS-80 Color Computer 3 outputs separate horizontal sync and vertical sync lines. So that's what the diodes are for. What we're going to do is connect those diodes uh, to the horizontal sink and vertical sink. And on the other end, we're gonna connect those together into the pin that the analog expects there to be a combined sink signal. It's a little messy, but I think it'll work. And I just used a little bit of heat, heat shrink tubing to keep those connections from shorting out across those diodes. This connection could probably use with a little bit of epoxy or perhaps even some hot glue just to keep all of those wires from bending too much and eventually popping off. Now, because the RGB port on the Color Computer 3 is keyed, in other words, one of the pins is missing, uh, I thought it would be good to try to add something so that I couldn't accidentally later come back and reverse the the direction of this because it would be pretty easy to use or pretty easy to do. It's just 10 pins, right? I mean, I could do it. I could put this in either way. So what I'm going to do is because I know uh, which pin uh, is missing on the connector or on the uh, the pins on the board, I can plug up one of these pins here and then it will mate up perfectly and I won't be able to mix it up later. Um, and I was trying to figure out what I could put in this connector here that would allow me to, to stop up one of the pins. It can't be something metal because I don't want to make any sort of inadvertent connection there with something on the board. So I don't know. Let me know your thoughts. I did come up with one solution I think will work. Just It just so happens the other day I picked up some of these uh, dental floss thingies, like pre, I don't know, they're supposed to be easier, I guess, to do, to do floss your teeth with. I don't know. But anyway, it occurred to me that it had a pick, a plastic pick on one end. And so I think what I'm going to do is just take one of these and push it into the pin that I want to block off, which should be this one. Uh, I'll push it in until it's good and tight. That's good and tight because it's bending. And then I'll just lop it off with some with my flush cutters and we should be good to go. There we go. Okay, we're finally ready to test all this stuff out. Uh, and I just spent a little bit of time because I started to do this uh, part of the video several times and I couldn't, there were, I kept finding other things I needed to test. So I wrote some notes here. Hopefully that'll keep me um, in sync. One thing that I need to point out, we've got the uh, uh, RGB to HDMI video adapter here, uh, which we made the cable for and got that set up. I've got the Coco SDC plugged in. Um, and of course, the memory is installed inside and the CPU is installed inside. I have already tested out this board so that I, I do know it works. And I was testing it along with one of the developers, Ian, because he didn't have an NTSC Color Computer 3 to test with. Uh, we knew that the RGB output was similar to EGA, so we thought it would work. And, and he's a super bright guy, and it was able to 
develop the software for this very quickly, and I would just be able to test it and send him um, uh, the result back and also give him some feedback on the type of color and uh, voltage levels and things I was finding were working really well. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is I do have a uh, the monitor that went with the Color Computer 3 out in the garage, and so I was able to use that to do some of the testing uh, of, of this. And, uh, in the end we got it working and it's working really well, but uh, that being what it is, I still want to show you what it can do. So you can see the fruit of our labors. So, uh, the first thing I think we need to do is to power this up, make sure that it boots up with, especially with the memory and the, uh, uh, the new CPU installed. So first thing first, let's just make sure it boots up. Here we go. Perfect. Okay, so that booted up right away. And you can see we're not at the standard um, prompt that you get when you first start a Color Computer 3, and that's because I have the Coco SDC installed already, and I have it programmed. It's very easy to do this to go to a, to start up a Explorer program automatically. So that's why we're seeing this screen here, the Coco SDC Explorer. What this allows you to do is you put your, um, uh, games, applications, whatever disk images you want on your SD card, put that in the Coco SDC, and then you can just browse them and select a game, for example. Let's do Dungeons of Dagger since that's my favorite game of all time. Um, I think, is it this one? Looks like it. Let's try it. Yep, there we go. So we've got Dungeons of Dagrath working now, um, and we can play the game, and it's as simple as that. Uh, let's go ahead and reboot this. And you can see now we're back at the Disk Extended Color Basic menu, and I can relaunch the Explorer just by hitting EXP. And it'll bring me back into the Explorer exactly where I left off. So that's essentially how the Coco SDC works. So now we've got our storage upgrade figured out, and it is working. Uh, let's move on now to the uh, the video aspect of the upgrade, which is the RGB to HDMI board um, that I do have configured here for the color computer. Now, if you remember on my previous episodes, you can go into the menus here, which I've already done, and you can select all of this information um, uh, to customize this to your liking. And you can see down here, I've got this set to U7 Tandy Coco 3, because we're using that extra U7 chip um, in order to distinguish all the RGB colors here. Um, so that's all set. I don't really have to do anything there. So that's all taken care of, but you can customize quite a bit. Um, just to show what the palette actually looks like, let's go ahead and go into the utilities part of my uh, all of my files here. And there is a, the Tandy Diagnostics disk And on that disk, there is a file card called chart.bas. This should bring up a palette. Um, you can see it's switching over to RGB mode. And it should bring up a palette of all the various colors, all 64 colors that you can have. So when I was testing this with uh, Ian, what I did was I plugged in my uh, monitor that um, that actually went with the system. I could take a picture of what the this particular palette looked like on the monitor. And then we were able to tweak this on the HDMI output until it looked exactly correct. And it was just a matter of figuring out where these colors, the voltages that these colors appeared at, and we got it to be pretty much perfect. So now anything that you run in RGB mode will use these colors and it will output the, the correct color pattern for your particular program. So that is, uh, that is pretty cool. Um, the other thing that you can do, I'm just going to reset this. The other thing that he was able to do was he was able to emulate uh, NTSC artifacting. So a lot of the older games, especially before RGB, the way that they produced color was with NTSC artifacting. And I didn't show that on my previous video because he hadn't developed that yet. Uh, but somebody on Facebook asked the question, does it do NTSC art artifacting? And of course, I asked Ian and Ian said, yeah, I think I can do that. So there are quite a number of games that allow you to take a look at the artifacting. Zaxxon is one of them. And the way that these games used to work, or the way that the Coco used to work, is that the Coco would randomly, on boot up, select one of several 
NTSC artifacting uh, colors as the primary color. So when you first booted up a game, um, it would show you either an orange screen or a blue screen, and you would basically have to hit reset until you saw the color you, you should be seeing. In most cases, it was the orange screen. Once you saw that, you could proceed to launch the game. But the only way you could select it was by resetting the machine. In this case, it's all programmable. So if I hit Zaxxon, uh, you can see, there we go. I've already, I already have this set up for um, NTSC artifacting, but I have NTSC artifacting turned off. So to turn it on, I can just hold down the middle pin or the middle button on the RGB to uh, HDMI board, and it will turn on artifacting. And this is exactly what this would look like if you were using a TV screen, for example, back in the day. Um, this is exactly what you would expect to see. So now I can just press one to start the game. I've got a uh, I've got a joystick um, ah, connected here, and we can play Zaxxon. So pretty cool. So this was the way that you got you know color, decent looking color back in the day was you use these NTSC artifacting. Uh, not unlike um, the Apple II, also, I believe, used the NTSC artifacting to produce their colors, although it did it with a, a slightly different methodology. Uh, Waz was able to, to create um, those colors a slightly different way, but, but, it's, but very similar. Anyway, that's NTSC artifacting, and I just died. Now, the other side benefit of emulating the NTSC artifacting is if you had a PAL version of the Tandy 1000, and I'll try to I'll try to play while I'm talking. It will be a little difficult. But if you had a PAL version, you just weren't able to get those NTSC artifacting because of the difference between NTSC and PAL. But Ian, since he's emulating these NTSC artifacts now, even if you have a PAL version of the Coco, you can actually get um, the artifacting uh, and see it for the first time, the way you've never been able to before. So yeah, a pretty cool side benefit of implementing this artifacting is the PAL versions should also now get the NTSC artifacting along with um, uh, the NTSC version. Okay, so I still have NTSC artifacting turned on, but let's go ahead and take a look at one of the ports of Donkey Kong. And there's a reason I wanna show you this um, because I wanna show you an upgraded version later that takes advantage of some of the upgrades. Uh, Donkey King, it's called. Yep, and here's that screen I was telling you about before. So. Basically, the manual would tell you when you get to the screen, hit the reset button until you see orange. Once you hit orange, press any key, and it'll continue to load the game. Something that's uh, unique to the color computer. So this was actually a fairly impressive port of Donkey Kong, in my opinion. I played the heck out of this game with my friends when I was a kid. Um, but you can see here, you know, it's just a stand. Now, this was not licensed from Nintendo, so this was a port that... Uh, I guess Tom Mix, his company made, and um, uh, wasn't licensed, so it's not an official port, but it is highly playable. Uh, I believe it has, you know, pretty much all the levels. It's not 100% exact, but you know, back in the day, uh, this would have—I think this came out what 1981. I, I forget what it said on the screen, but this was a pretty good port of Donkey Kong for 1981 for a, a uh, home computer with these specs. Uh, certainly better even than some of the consoles like the uh, Intellivision or Atari, if you played those Donkey Kongs, I think this one's slightly better. Uh, this will come into play later when we test the memory. Uh, so remember what this looked like, and then we'll come back to this in a little bit. Okay, I'm gonna turn NTSC artifacting off for now. And uh, let's go ahead and take a look at, uh, remember we there was a uh, program to test the, menu, me the memory in the service manual. They gave you this little test program. I've gone ahead and typed that in and we can uh, we can take a look at that. So here's my disk with my uh, programs on it. Uh, let's just go ahead and load this disk. I can hit Shift-1. It'll mount that drive in Drive-1, and now I can exit the program, and that drive is mounted. Okay, now with that uh, drive mounted, I should be able to hit Drive-1, which will... You can have up to four drives on the color computer, um, but this is emulating drive one. So I have drive one. I can hit DIR and it'll show me the programs there. Um, 512 RAM is the one that I uh, typed in from that service manual. So let's go ahead and load that. It's loaded and now we can list the program. 
So let's run it. The thing about this program is um, not 100% good with all the peaks and pokes in here, but I believe it's basically just picking one certain uh, set of memory and doing some random number and then checking numbers back. Uh, now this was good only for the 512 K version, so it's only going to test 512 K, but we can still use it because this came with 128 K. So if the 512 K is working, we at least know that it's going above what was in here originally and it should be working. So let's go ahead and run it and see what happens. All right, so you can see now it's doing some random assignments, I believe, to memory and then reading it back to make sure that it uh, reads back correctly. All right, there we go. RAM test is good. Um, so we are definitely, the RAM is definitely good, at least up to 512 uh, K, uh, which is much more. It's amazing to think that this computer came out with only 4K initially, the Coco One. Uh, certain versions of it, I believe, only had 4K when it very, the very first one that came out back in 1980. So, um, yeah, it's pretty amazing to think that we now have over two megabytes available. Uh, and there is a mod where you can go up to eight meg on this particular board that's coming out uh, pretty soon. Okay, so it looks like the memory and uh, the video and everything's working. There's one last thing I want to try, which is a game that will not run with less than 512K of memory. Um, and that is an, a port of Donkey Kong that came out a little bit later. Um, and this is an arcade accurate port of Donkey Kong for this machine. So if you think about walking into an arcade, walking up to a Donkey Kong cabinet and playing that game, this uh, should look very, very similar. So let's go ahead and try to load that. Okay, here's the load screen. Even the font on this actually... The initial font looks just like the same font that was on the arcade game. It's pretty amazing. All right, so here we can set the configuration, number of lives, uh, when you get your bonus lives, the difficulty, et cetera, et cetera, uh, the palette type, which is RGB in this case, and the sound. So let's go ahead and hit enter and see if this loads. Wow, that's pretty cool. I wonder if that is emulating it looks just like a C64 when you load programs onto a C64 or a, a ZX Spectrum with the loading color. I don't know whether that is, that can't be, uh, that has to be emulated because we obviously don't have a 6502 or a Z80 to test with. All right, so here we go. Here's the, uh, this looks exactly like the arcade game. I'm just going to hit a, hit the button to put a coin in and then hit the button again to start. Wow, this looks exactly like the arcade game. Music, sound, fonts, everything. Let's see how it plays. Yeah, this is amazing. Uh, I would have never thought this was possible on a color computer because you saw the other version that I, play I was playing before. Um, this just is this just is incredible. I can't believe that it actually and it runs really well too. No slowdowns, uh, no problems with um, with skipping or or hesitating of any kind. If I didn't know better, I would say I was playing the arcade game. So this is a really good port. Now one thing I will say is uh, I'm going to stop playing for a minute. One thing I will say is that I can see uh, on the screen that it's actually. Under scanning, I guess, might be the right word. So, so that could be a problem with the the the, VG, the uh, RGB to HDMI board not recognizing the video mode change that probably took place. So the the resolution probably is off, and the board isn't really pro, isn't really capable of detecting that. So it's possible that I could go into the menus and change the resolution manually, but honestly, it's just chopping off a little bit here. So this is actually, that's okay with me. I'm missing a little bit, you know, a few pixels on the top, a few pixels on the bottom, but actually that is, uh, that's perfectly fine. I, I don't mind that at all. Probably not worth going in and taking the time to change the configuration. But I'll be honest, this plays exactly 100% like the arcade version um, on a TRS-80 color computer. That is amazing. All the graphics, everything is identical. 
So I, I don't know what to say. I'm a little bit blown away because this looks really, really good. Here, let me die with this fireball here. Well, there's so much more that I could have shown, but unfortunately we're running out of time. The last thing I needed to do with this was just clean up the case just a little bit. It was in really great shape when I got it, but there was a few pen marks and things that I needed to clean up. And the other thing I noticed that was missing was the feet. Now, I didn't have the right size feet, but I do want to at least get it up off the plastic. So these slightly smaller feet will do a good job for now until I can order some bigger ones. Now this badge still has its plastic coating on, so we should probably uh, do a really slick peeling off of that badge, right? Eh, I don't think so. I think we can do one step better. After all, this badge says 128K color computer, and this computer no longer has 128K, it has two megs, or 2048K. So what I think we need is a new badge. So by using a little hot air and a box cutter knife, I was able to get the label off pretty cleanly and apply this brand new Tandy 2048K Color Computer 3 label. That looks great. Well, you'll have to excuse me for not doing my hair and uh, shaving. It is a pandemic after all, but I'm really excited with how these upgrades turned out. Uh, number one, we've got a new profile for the RGB uh, to HDMI board. Um, so now you can use that project with the uh, Coco 3. This will probably be uh, the last for a while on that topic, just because I've done quite a few of them. And, and really this thing's turned out to be a great project that I think I'll use with a lot more systems. Uh, but also being able to add two megabytes of RAM to the Coco 3 is pretty amazing. And the versatility of the Motorola 6809 processor is really astounding to go from a system that was released back in 1980 and ended up uh, closing out with the Coco 3, I think around 1991, uh, to be really highly functional and even produce uh, the capability to run a game like an arcade quality replica of Donkey Kong is pretty astounding in my book. Now, although I'm not going to be doing any more RGB to HDMI videos for the near future, I, I do have one more video planned for the Coco 3, and that's because one of the ways you can take advantage of these upgraded capacities in this system is to run a new operating system, or was new back in the day, uh, called OS 9. OS 9 ran great on the Color Computer 3 and gave you functionalities that were eh, quite a bit more like DOS than just what you got at the basic prompt. So I definitely want to dive into OS 9 and some of the variants and show you what you can do to take this computer even further. If you like this episode, please make sure to subscribe to the videos. That will make sure that my videos come up in your feed as you're browsing through content to watch. And it really does help promote the channel too. So you're doing me a big favor there. Uh, be sure to like, and also leave comments if there's anything I got wrong or maybe you'd like to see more of, please leave that in the comments below. If you want to take that next step, go ahead and sign up on Patreon. I'm just about to start a series of behind the scenes videos that will be available for patrons only. And that helps me uh, provide uh, funding for new cameras, new lights, uh, things that'll make the content on the channel even better. So with that, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. If you want to support me on Patreon, you can go to patreon.com slash RetroHackShack and sign up. If you support me at a high enough level, you can get your picture in the credits, just like Parker here.